spoken they. I haven't thought about flying for a long time. I haven't dreamed of that moment when I was alone above the clouds for a long time. I haven't dreamed of waking up in a room surrounded in blue and green grass for more years than I could dream of memory. I haven't walked back into the past or scratched on the doors of my origins where it all came from since I held up that cape for the last time. Return to Kent Town 10th year anniversary edition is a revised version of Andy Ern's first poetry book. The book can be purchased from Amazon and it contains numerous additional material. Spoken Label Hi, it's Andy Ern from Spoken Label. Thank you today for streaming or downloading another episode of Spoken Label. Spoken Label was originally set up on beginning of the 2016 and as of speaking has currently nearly 300 sessions. The full archive is available on Spoken Label full stop bandcamp.com although it is available for free for stream and download if you wish. I am always grateful for any sort of kind of donation to enable me to keep the running costs of this podcast going and enjoy. Take care. Bye-bye. Spoken Label. Hi guys, Andy N. Spoken Label. Back in the house. And a lovely cool Friday evening, actually. Which is the contrast to the last one or two I've done, where it's been like saunas in this flat. Now, over to my fav- second favourite country in the world today, behind England Island. And I've got a great gentleman with me tonight, where he did a fantastic feature on John Lennon for my columns on the Sunday Tribune recently. Enjoyed it that much. I've got him here tonight. I've got Stan that not to me. So Stan, tell everybody first, mate, obviously, who you are. So you surprised me where you actually came from. I wasn't expecting that one. And yeah. where you live now, and we'll start from there. Mate. Yeah, so I've been living in Cork for 40 odd years. Um, but I was, my, both my parents are from Cork, but I was actually born in London. I was born in Chiswick uh, and I lived and uh, grew up and was educated in London until I was nearly 12. I went, we lived in the Elephant, predominantly Elephant and Castle, and I went to Robert Browning School, very famous poet. Um, and we came back here to live in the summer of 76, and I've been here pretty much since. My other three siblings all went back to England. Uh, two of them are still there, uh, and my twin sister is in Dublin. But I, I met a, a girl when I was 17. Uh, we married with four children. We've been separated for the last two years, but I settled here, um, you know, with the family. And I just, like, I love London. But I always knew I didn't want to bring kids up there because when we were growing up in London, we used to come here on holidays uh, and the freedom here in Ireland for anybody who hasn't been is is still. But at that time, was just unreal. I mean, I grew up in the Elephant and we had like 500 yards around the house that we could go without telling my mum and dad if, if we wanted to go any further. We had to have permission. We'd come back here on the holidays uh, and you'd leave the house at nine o'clock in the morning and nobody gave the fiddlers if you came back at 10 or 11 o'clock that night. You know, We were out robbing apples and picking blackberries and swimming in rivers and things. Oh, I've done that. Do you know what I mean? I've, I've done the apple thing myself, actually, because, <laughs> yeah. oh, um, and this is about you, but it's a good story, this one. I'll come c- c- cut in quick with it. But um, mm. I went over to a certain famous castle, which I'm not going to name, on the East Sussex coast. If people can research, they can find it. This is, <laughs> wasn't much older than what you were, probably, at the time, where me and my mate came out with there, and we went into an orchard thinking, oh, it's a public land. But it wasn't. We had this the, um, the gamekeeper <laughs> chasing us out with a wrap of a gun. So. Yeah, but at that age, getting the chase is half the battle. We used to go to the place Robin Apples and we used to go specifically because we knew we'd get a chase. <laughs> oh, I can. And we'd I, hang around for as long as it took to get a chase. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I like your style, mate. Yeah. Well, like I say, hopefully you're not doing that nowadays. So I'm gonna no, say. I, don't, I, I, don't have the, I don't have the physical prowess for that stuff anymore. <laughs> same for me, same for me. I've tried doing that nowadays. But I think my left knee would give up, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even yeah. that's all. Even that's all. I've misjudged the running in it, but it, it runs one of the trees. But that's a story another day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Stan, I know. I know. Obviously, what you've been talking about for. Um, tell people, obviously, where all your creativity came from, then, because I know you've been active for quite some time, haven't you, in bits and pieces? Yeah, and and I mean, it's it's one of those. I mean, it's in, it, predominantly, it came to me quite late in life. I mean, 
I always wrote little poems, and um, but you know, in, you know, intermittently when I when I was young, I was always fascinated with words. We used to when we would have on holidays, my mum and dad used to have a, a dictionary in the car, and my mum would open and pick a word, and we used to have to try and guess what was going on. I used to, ha- you know, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather here in Cork when we were on holidays, and he used to have the um, the Reader's Digest, and I used to love the Reader's Digest, and you know that little thing at the start where they'd have a word and they'd give you three definitions, you had to pick one, and I always loved word searches and crosswords and. So I was always fascinated with words. Um, but I have, a, I have a younger brother. He's two years younger than me. And he could draw recognisable portraits when he was 10. Wow. So, you know, he was the creative one and the rest of us just, you know, kind of put it to one side. He's now one of the most famous street artists in the world, actually, my brother. His story is great. If we had time, I'd tell you, because he was, it wasn't a straight line for him, even though it probably could have been and maybe should have been. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, there's, you know, my mum, uh, who's no longer with us, but she used to say to me that, you know, in my teenage years, I was drawing and I used to love making things and jigsaw puzzles. But I never really had any value or explored it. And then when I was 40, around my 40s, I started writing. Um, I started writing short stories initially. And I, it turns out, oh, with hindsight, I started writing because I was dealing with depression, even though I wasn't diagnosed. So a lot of my early short stories are really dark, really dark. Uh, and I would have said when I was writing that they weren't autobiographical, but of course, when you look back at them, it feels like looking in the mirror, you know? Uh, and then yeah. I got the diagnosis and um, I was working with the Julia Cameron's The Artist Way at the time, and that was hugely uh, influential and remains influential in my creativity. And then I, you know, I, I left, I was with the Irish Naval Service and Military Organization for 21 years, and I left there. And I suppose I spent a couple of years trying to, you know, that cliche, trying to find myself. And I was doing a lot of therapy and right through all that to creativity, just grew and grew and grew and it was a huge part of me expressing the, the, the anguish I was feeling you know and then you know I did a drawing class and uh, I learned how to draw which was you know cathartic and I remember my brother had on, on the bed in our bedroom wall he had lots of art but he had one um, which was a 12 inch cover of Japan's um, ghosts and I actually drew it a few years ago myself just to you know, it was a cathartic exercise. Uh, and then it just it just grew and grew and I started writing poetry in a very strange way, which we'll talk about in a while. Um, I was all still writing short stories. I wrote a novel, didn't get it published. I was still dealing with a lot of self-esteem issues with the depression. So even though I got, you know, some nice feedback, I kind of abandoned it. And then I just kept going. And now, I, you know, I've done poetry. I perform, I do spoken word. I work with a band. I design artwork for my poetry. I run my own business designing loads of different things lots of cork stuff lots of you know weddings and stuff um i've done poetry films uh just done one recently which we, has been you know has turned out really well and is, is going to be um it's going to get us premiere at the cork indie festival so it's just one of those i think for me it was um it was a desperation that started me i, I know that now the idea of writing was to try and get you know the anguish in me out the first short story i ever wrote was about a guy standing on the top of the cliff in the pouring rain thinking of jumping um, no, I was never suicidal. And in that story, he doesn't jump. And lots of my creativity played at that idea of being really unhappy with the hope on the other side of it. One of the pieces I'll read later on is very strong in that area. Uh, and then, I, you know, I somehow found a way to just keep exploring and exploring because it was making me so happy. And it's been incredibly good to me uh, and continues to be really good to me. I don't know about you, Andy, but I'm always in better form if I've done a little bit of writing or something creative in the day. And if yeah, I can do it, Yeah, and if I can do it first thing, then I'm set up for the day, no matter what else happens. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I'm the other way around, mate, because usually I do my creativity. Because when I'm in the office at the day job and I'm back at it full time, I'm looking things now, I can't, I can't be creative at half five in the morning. It's just, I'm the brain just not in gear. So yeah, yeah, leave yeah. at quarter past six in the morning, I'll do some reading for half an hour on the bus heading into work. And yeah. depending on how tired I am, is how much reading I do. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I don't mean, why do I do mine when I get home normally? So. Yeah, and I, I, I've been there where you are, but I mean, I'm self-employed now, so I've kind of set myself up where I'm sitting now while we're talking is in the attic in the house, which I converted into an office a few years ago. So my routine now is I get up around five or six and I do the morning page, which is a Julia Cameron practice, and then I do a meditation. And I have some breakfast and I, and I normally in, the, in, in here in the office no later than seven o'clock and I do my writing before I go for a swim at a half a day. And then when I come back, depending on what's help, happening, if I can keep going, then I'll keep going, you know? But I find the early morning because there's no distractions. The phone's not going to ring. Like my kids are grown up now as well. Um, but like in the days when I was traveling to work, oh man, it was really hard to do it in the morning. 
because you'd sit down to do it and your brain is thinking about work like do you know what I mean just thinking about what's coming down the road like and I mean I don't know how, what your commute is like but I commute about 40 minutes to work you know it's it's just you know your morning is is what's the, it's just tight when you're traveling to work like do you know what I mean yeah yeah no I'll get it completely with it so it is it is that one it's you work the day job takes over your life whether you like it or not yeah yeah. And it's I, I'm damn proud of the amount, the amount of work I actually do in outside work. That's why it keeps me sane a lot of the time. So, but that one, so definitely. Now, um, I want to talk to you about first of all today, but some of your guest speaking, because I know you're obviously, I know you do obviously like you're a motivational speaker, and I thought it really interesting some of the places you're actually done your guest speaking at. Like I see you, you did some over at um, Cork Prison, for example. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, I always say with bios, like they can look very extravagant on paper, you know. Mm. And it, it's not that I've done huge amounts of it, but you know, my my journey. What, one of the really interesting things about me, if I can tell myself, tell say myself that I'm interesting, is when I was diagnosed with depression, I just told people immediately, um, which is so unusual, right? So the idea of speaking about you know my journey with mental health has never been an issue, even though it's very scary and it's 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 um. It can be really upsetting or discombobulating to use a nice word. So because of that, and then because my work, my creative work deals with, with that a lot, then you know opportunities have, have, have cropped up. Like so the Cork prison thing was was a, as part of the the centenary anniversary of the 1916 rising year, where we I was involved with a, with a small project where we wrote three poems, one about Ireland in um, 1916, one about Ireland in 2016, and God bless us one about Ireland in 2016 and a friend of mine that I used to be in the Navy with is a deputy governor and he saw it and he asked would I take it would we take it into prison so we went up to court prison it was an amazing experience and an amazing experience so we did the poems and then we you know we spoke about mental health and challenges and and they were just amazing to deal with like just amazing to deal with. that's something I'd love to do more of is the is the kind of mental health advocate I work I've done I've done workshops with kids for the last couple of years teenagers who have dropped out of mainstream school over the last seven or eight years, I've done a lot of work um, at different times with people trying to get back to work. We've been long-term unemployed, lots of challenges. This year, I'm going to do um, a writing workshop with the Irish Wheelchair Association. And it, that, that, that work um, always excites me. It's massively rewarding. It's hugely challenging in lots of ways, but it's massively rewarding. And that gives me you know, a platform to go and talk about my story and what I've come through. Um, and you know, my, my story is challenging enough there's far worse stories out there, but there's far easier stories out there as well. And what I what I learned very quickly about, especially being a man, talk about mental health. Um, every time you open your mouth and talk about it, somebody takes something from it, you know. And that's that's an amazing gift. Do you know what I mean? It's an amazing gift. Yeah, again, yeah, no, completely. I find it amazing because the people who look at your website, we'll list it later on, is how much stuff have you actually done. And it's this why I can relate a lot to what your likes done because. My started off, my journey started off a few years before yours, in probably similar sort of circumstances to a degree. And it's one of those things, and I'm sure you agree with me on this, it's like you start off just as a poet, you probably you wouldn't have envisaged, would you, 10 or no matter how many years later, you were doing stuff you were doing nowadays. It's just like, it's well, almost like it's just a start in it, yeah. It's, it's literally mind-boggling. I mean, I look at my own bio at times and go, holy Jesus, you know? It is literally mind-boggling. Um, and, you know, what I kind of say to younger people when they're, you know, when they're talking about, you know, when they're starting out, I just say to them, you know, any, any opportunity you get, just take it. And if that's, I mean, open mics is where we all start. Uh, and I was a regular at the, the Ovale open mic here in, and still am in Cork. That's the, the, the longest-running porch and I probably in the country now. Is it yeah, back in person? Also, is it back in person yet? Is it, or is it still on? No, no. Hopefully September. It's hopefully September. September. Um, Fingers crossed. <laughs> and then I started attending music overnights because I write poetry. You know, that's that's in, inspired and derived from music. Um, and you know, you, things just happen. I mean, the guy that I do most of the, the work with, who does the music with my stuff, I met him at an open mic. And actually, what happened was I went and I had a piece. I can't even remember which one it was. No. And I remember thinking before I went, I'd asked the guy who was running the open mic to play some music behind it. And I asked him and he said, no, I don't, I'm not good in that area, Stan. Uh, imp improvisation isn't my stuff. But I asked Malcolm. And to be honest with you, my first thought was, ah, fuck that. I'm not asking somebody I don't know. But, you know, about 10 minutes later, I just said to him, he played along. And then 
you know, I went again a couple of weeks later and we played, he played along again and then just over a period of time, he played quite a few and then he said to me, you know, have you ever thought about recording anything? And we ended up in the studio and recorded five pieces, one which he didn't put music to, he said he didn't need it, was still in dispute over that. Ah, <laughs> um, yes, and, yeah, right, it would be, yeah. Yeah, and then it just, you know, it just kept, it just kept moving and, I mean, I, I, I like, if somebody had said to me, when I, even when I started, you know, being creative and writing that you'd become a poet, I would have actually laughed. And if they'd said you'd be a performance poet, I'd have said, you know, get yourself a hospital appointment. And if they said you'd be a performance poet working with musicians, I'd have just said, look, you desperately need therapy. Do you know what I mean? So you're right. You look back and go, wow, how did that happen? But it's just little, it's, it's incremental stuff, you know? It's just incremental stuff. Yeah. Now, I want to touch on it to give people an example, a few examples, obviously, of how, how, some of your different projects have gone. I'm going to talk about a few old ones before we go into what's coming, this new the current stuff on the what's beyond that. Is yeah. I found really interesting about your when you between 2010 and 14, where you self published your one short story, a, un, a unique series of books that obviously are one short story each. Where did this idea come from, first of all? If you can remember that far back, yeah, no, I can. I, I can remember it clearly. So I was, I was writing short stories at the time, and I probably had about a dozen of them. And I was, you know, I, I have to be really honest. My self esteem was, was really at rock bottom still at that stage. Uh, and I had a couple published in a local paper here, which was absolutely fucking amazing. And then I started, you know, um, submitting, and they were they were getting rejected. And I, I was kind of struggling. And then I, you know, I, I did a writing course and we were talking about all the short story as, as a form is really struggling. It's very hard to get a collection of short stories published now unless you're Stephen King or somebody, you know what I mean? And then just out and over, I got this notion, what if I just put one short story into a book? Um, and then like, they, I mean, look, the story is, even for me, when I think of it, it's incredible. So I published the first one, the 23rd of October, 2010. And in the build-up, I decided I didn't want to publish it under my own name. So I created a, an alias by, an, by anagramming my name from Stanley Knott into Late Natins. And then I wrote a bio to Late Natins, which was complete nonsense. He was into mirror writing and all this kind of stuff. And then, because I wanted to put a book together, I started playing with the kind of legal stuff you read at the start of the book and the thank you sections. And I mean, they're beautiful things. They're leather bound, the six of them. Uh, and the idea was there was only one book, one copy of the book, but one short story in it. And it was to create a journey for the story. And I tracked, so I published six of them over three years and I tracked their journeys for about five years. And then it was just wow. exhausting trying to stay on top of six different people having six different books. In different <laughs> yeah. and, but the really interesting thing about it then for me is that as I wrote each one, the, the character that I created late in that, it just grew and grew and grew. And I ended up with this absolutely enormous world in my head, and I'm still working on that project, fucking 12, 11 years later. I've taken into whole loads of different formats, and I've currently almost finished it as a book. I finally decided two years ago, I'm just gonna write it as a book. Um, and it's a fantastic project, it's a kid's project. Late Nattens is my superhero, and his destiny in life is to prevent this evil, evil character who's trying to eradicate storytelling from the world. And he's stealing kids' stories and taking them out to this fantasy land and torturing them. And Lake Nattens is trying to stop him stealing the stories and he needs kids to help him save the stories. So, I mean, every time I talk about it, I get really excited. Um, but here I am 11 years later, still trying to... It's close now to being finished. I'm, I'm getting ready to get it to agents. I had it shortlisted last year, which sounds much stronger than it is, for the Penguin Random House thing, um, which turns out to be a huge deal. So, yeah, it's just, again, it was, it was just... Like, I tend to have unusual ideas and that that was a very unusual idea and with hindsight it served a huge purpose at the time it allowed me to publish my work without putting myself at front and center with it um, but obviously then it gave me an unbelievable um it gave me a, a, an even better idea and that's kept me sustained creatively for years even though it's been massively frustrating as well you know so hopefully oh, cool. that'll see some future next year you know good luck with it definitely so now um i also want to ask you as well about your um, ma ma biannual audio magazine, Solstead Sounds. Yeah, Solstead is, Sounds was, was one of my favourite projects. It, it's, you know, it was a shame that it, it kind of came to an end. So one of the things that struck me relatively early on when I started performing poetry is that there was, in this country, pretty much nowhere to go to get spoken word published on a regular basis. And I was really, and I'm still a great friend of a guy called Shane Vaughan. 
and he was um he's from Limerick, he'd been in Cork for a while, but he's up in Limerick and he was running a thing called Stanzas, which is really cool. And I approached him and said, Look, I have this idea about a spoken word publication, and we agreed to do it twice here around the solstice, and he did it under Stanzas umbrella, which gave it an audience immediately. So we published two each year for four years, a winter and a, and a summer edition. And it was absolutely amazing. I mean, the stuff that came in like was just unreal. And we literally just put a shout out saying, if you do spoken word, we'd love you to submit, do what you want with it. We I mean, people send it in with, you know, sat, like, what you call them, soundscapes, so the people send them with music in it, people send them in with ambient music on them, people send them in as full on performance things. It was absolutely incredible. And we got it, we got an editor for each one. Uh, Carl McLally edited one, Dave Lorden edited another one, um, Clara Rose Thornton edited another one. We had somebody in England um, lined up to edit one and they pulled out. Can't remember who. But yeah, it was, it was a fantastic experience. But what happened was the Stanzas umbrella was really important to it and that was being run by four young lads. Uh, and <laughs> amazingly, one summer, they all made decisions to go back to college without, without consulting each other. So they had to kind of take a, a sabbatical, which turned out to be a long time sabbatical. So it just faded away. I didn't have the energy to do it on my own. Uh, but I can send you some of the stuff. I still have all the stuff, and some of the stuff on it was absolutely amazing. Love to, love, my favorite love, project. To, love to read some, definitely, mate. Yeah, send some over, definitely. I'll give them email address afterwards. I'd love to read that, definitely. So, yeah. send my cup of tea. Now, obviously, more recently, then, I know you've obviously got a book on the way at the moment, haven't you? As well, you're just telling me off my before. Yeah, yeah. So, again, you know, I've been writing poetry, submitted for a little while, then stopped submitting, then started doing an awful lot of spoken word, went to Coventry with Ovale, which was an amazing experience. Still in touch with quite a few people there. Um, and, you know, I've, ga I've gathered, I suppose, now at this stage, I probably have 90 or 100 poems, all in the same format. I write them using song titles of chosen artists. I'll explain that a little bit later. And, and then somewhere towards the end of last year, I just thought, you know, I need to start putting this together. So the, 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 the poems are selected, they're, they're sectioned, and I'm currently writing introductory essays to each section, and I've probably got only two to go, and then I'm going to self-publish that. I, you know, one of the brilliant things about One Short Story to be told is, you have, like, when you self-publish, you have to do everything yourself. So I did all the illustrations myself, I did the layout myself, I did the printing myself, I picked the paper, I picked the cover, you know, and you, you just learn a huge amount, and then you have all those contacts. So actually, the... the the practical side of putting the collection together is, is probably for me way easier than actually picking the poems, you know? So yeah, that's, that's, that's about ready to go. There's going to be, I think 40, maybe 42 poems in there broken into sections, social consciousness, mental health, love poems. There's a miscellaneous section. Uh, and it's brilliant because it's allowed me to put um, a couple of poems in there that uh, I hadn't even really put on paper before. I've got a poem that I wrote years ago called public service announcement there's a video for it on my website it's a two it's a two voice thing i've only ever performed it twice once with somebody and once with a backing track doing one of the voices but it's a really challenging one because at the end the two voices are going simultaneously um and i never thought it would translate transfer well or translate onto the page but when i was putting the collection together i thought i'll have a look at this and i found a way to lay it out and that it reads really well and and that, that's like I think that's that's a really strong piece. So yeah, it's it's you know, it's lovely to see that you know. Well, I've enjoyed seeing my work in bulk in one place. Do you know what I mean? And again, it's a bit like what you said a while ago. You know, you're kind of looking and going, "Wow, where did they all come from?" Do you know what I mean? Have I really got that many? Because you just write and write and you put them away. And I keep all mine on the drive. But then when I started this, I went it's like doing a stock check and going, "Holy shit." Yeah, oh, exactly. One, you know? Now, do we sneak up on you sometimes? Because my other half, Amanda's, um, she's um, we, we, we've been co-running a little informal writing workshop for about a year now over lockdown, and she went through her files last night to try and get together all the little flash fiction pieces she'd wrote looking for something, and she found she had nearly 50 pieces. And yeah, you do you it, it, you just sneak yeah. up on you something you don't expect yeah. to, do you? So, you don't sneak up on you, yeah, you're 100% correct, yeah. 100%. Gotcha. Brilliant. Now, okay, I, I want to ask you a couple of other things we can close tonight as well. I've been really enjoying looking at your art prints before as well on your website. Now, obviously, I know you've told us a bit about your history of art before. How, how was your art, do you, do you find the, has your art changed much over the years, like your writing in a very similar sort of way? Dramatically, dramatically. Um, so I wouldn't consider myself the greatest drawer in the world. If I if I really put my mind to it, I, I can do it, but I tend to like sketching really quickly and kind of rough looks, you know. 
but it's amazing how things come together. So I set myself up as self-employed about eight years ago. And what I run is a, is a print and embroidery business. And there's lots of crests and stuff. And, and I got software from Adobe to help me with that. And, and then I self-taught myself how to use Adobe. And then when I started this, I got this notion about creating artwork for the poems. And what I was doing is I was doing a sketch and then I, I, they were all A3 initially. I, I would take, take, so let's just say, and I'm going to read an Amy Winehouse poem in a minute, it's really short, because she's 10 years dead this week. I would oh, then- cause, cause It's gone very quick, that as well, God. Yeah, that's frightening, yeah. So I take, I take, a, I have a look at Amy Winehouse and then I'd, I'd look at all her albums on her single covers and I take influence from them to create a piece of art. And then I do a little drawing of some position and of some piece and I and I and I drop it into it. And then what happened is over a period of time, because I got, you know, I got much better with the Adobe Illustrator, the, the art I could create in Adobe Illustrator improved. And then I had a breakthrough last November in the middle of a depressive episode. A friend of mine asked me that I would I had ever written an Ella Fitzgerald poem. And I said, no, but I, you know, I, I'll happily do one because I needed a distraction. So I and what happened at that stage, what was happening was I was writing the poems and doing the artwork simultaneously. The poem would even be finished, you know. And right in the middle of it, I thought, why don't I fucking create an album cover size piece of art? And that was just a major breakthrough. And, and that's what I've been doing now for the since. Um, so I create 12 inch covers um, and I've now created actual 12 inch covers. Like there's a front and a back and there's a piece of vinyl goes into it and I can put the label on it. And it's just and I tell you now, uh, Andy, I could do that all day, every day. It's just you, I just get lost in it. But to answer your question, my art now is a million miles from where it was two years ago, and it's light years from where it was five years ago. Completely transformed. Yeah, completely transformed. Because I can see people looking at your art and your website because you do other things on top of that. And I look, I think your rock t-shirts look absolutely tremendous. Thank you. Like it's um I've just just been looking at the one on Ian Curtis, and obviously like well, Joy Division actually, obviously me being Mancunian, of course. I've been a, supporting a fellow Stratonium, which is Ian Kurtz, because he lived in Stratford at one point. So, right, yeah, yeah. so he's one of our one of ours straight away. So, but look at them, they're acting, they're incredible detail as well. And it's like it's what I find interesting is, and this is a point for you in your writing, is is that you're doing so much different sorts of creativity. Do you find it hard switching your brain from one thing to another sometimes? It's like different switches, isn't it, really? So. Yeah, sometimes. Um, generally with creativity, no. Um, but there are times. I'm, a couple of years ago with this kids project that came out of One Short Story Told, I was doing a business course trying to get it, trying to get funding to build it as a, as a kind of interactive website. That was hugely challenging because business language, when you're writing for the course, and creative language are two different things. But I'm one of those people. I can have four or five things open here on a daily basis. So today, now I worked on the an essay for the poetry collection i did uh, a piece i'm doing these a series of videos at the moment in pure cork stuff i did some work on the design um that was uh, giving my next question actually oddly enough actually so yeah. <laughs> I, did a, I did a design for um jerry rafferty's baker street it's a, it's a it's a it's a present for a friend of mine so and i'm happy to work between three and four things the only frustration is sometimes you get so sucked into one thing you forget about another thing do you know what i mean so, like I was doing, I was when I was writing that new Cork one today. I started, I looked at the main file and started to break it into original files, and then I found one that I'd completely fucking forgotten about. It's nearly finished. Do you know what I mean? Awesome. So that's that, that's the challenge. Um, but I'm one of those people, Andy. I like variety and I like being distracted. And the challenge for me is to, and you know, I'm much much better than I used to be. And some of this was underpinned again by the the, the lack of self esteem and the you know the depression. Finishing. Yeah. Into the world is always a bigger challenge for me than actually starting things and creating things. Now, obviously, tell us about where then the Pure Cork project came from, then. Because if it goes on your website, there's an awful lot of stuff there. It's brilliant as well. So, like, I, I've always been obsessed with language, right? Always, uh, even growing up and, and you know, growing up in London and speaking Queen's English and going back to Cork and hearing the slang it was all, always, always amazed me. And it's a, it's a good few years ago now um, as part of the business because I was looking to do things with the business um, and, I, and I, I just got this mad idea for Christmas. So I, I did Christmas cards, I designed Christmas cards. It just said, it was four different ones, but the front of them would say, Merry Christmas from the Rebel City or Merry Christmas from the Rebel County or the Banks of Lee, all court stuff. And then I thought, because again, I just had these unusual ideas. So the inside of them then were Christmas messages written in court language. 
So, I mean, you wouldn't have a clue what I'm talking about when I say, you know, there's a lang of loads, a lang has gone down, pan of Gatton. But they, it's just got this connection with people. It's like writing stuff in Mancunian slang. And you show it to somebody from Manchester and they get it. And somebody who, who's from Manchester living abroad will absolutely love it. And that's literally where it came from. And then it, it just, I did Valentine's cards. I've done mugs, T-shirts, all that kind of thing. And then re- this year, um, we did, we did I, well, I wrote a piece about the, for the first anniversary of the COVID. Um, and what I did was I rewrote Ghost Town from the specials. And then I put spoken word pieces between the music um, and just did a, like, it's, it's almost like a tribute to the COVID thing, you know? So in Cork, things and bureaus of boys and girls. And so if we're trying to get someone to listen to you, say, come here to me, things. So that means listen to me, boy. And I started with that. So come here to me, things. Come here to me, boys. This COVID, it, it's a year since this COVID thing locked us down. Do you know that, boy? Do you know that? Yeah, I'm pure sick of it all, that. And, and it just developed. And it's just great fun to work with because it's, it's funny language. Uh, so I did the ghost on one and then I've started doing these little videos on a regular basis. I just did one today now with the two lads from Skibbereen winning a gold medal. And, and again, it's just, it's one of those things that when I, you, you know yourself, when you get a new creative idea, there's a real excitement to it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just fun. And it's, it's such, it's a great distraction from writing. So, I mean, writing is a very, you know yourself, writing's quite serious as in your brain is quite serious about it. I don't write, I don't write any kind of comedy stuff, right? So it's a brilliant distraction from trying to write a kid's project or trying to put a poetry collection together or run a business, which I am doing, you know. Um, it's a lovely distraction because it just allows your brain to go into this real fun, exaggerated space. Um, and then I have to put on a Cork accent as best <laughs> I can. You know, go for a really strong Cork accent. And, you know, so far it's gone really well and it, it is, it's great fun. And I think it's got great potential as well, you know. I was great idea. I was looking at then if I have you me. If people see that in your area, I think they'll be proud of you if you said to Hugh, you've shown me. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I might lot. read one in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, love you too. Love you too, yeah. mate. Definitely. So let's do it. Yeah, let's I do it. The one I wrote today, actually, just for the crack. <laughs> why not? Why not? Let's yeah, do it. Why okay. Not? Right. Why okay. Not? Well, that's all my questions anyway, to be honest with you, Stan. A couple of things to wrap up with anyway, to conclude. Yeah. I always like to ask the artist what they've got planned next. Well, I think you've pretty well covered most of it anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. is there anything else that you need people to be aware of forthcoming for yourself, mate? I mean, I think the poetry collection for me is, is going to be a big thing, you know? Um, mm. There's an album going to go with it. Uh, I'm I'm really excited about the music that we've created with it. I'm really, I've got a Joy Division piece with, with Dave O'Connell did an amazing job in it. So Atmosphere is my favourite Joy Division song, that, that Ooh, quote. Yeah. That, you know, oh, got it, just... It. Go straight through me in that song every time I, every time I hear that's Atmosphere. Was, it goes. The poem I write was, was called Atmosphere. It's about mental health, but it was called Atmosphere. And Dave, I'll say, I have to send you this anyway. No, Andy, no, please, please, Dave definitely. I want to hear it. Yeah. An, he took an instrumental version of Atmosphere and dropped it in behind the spoken word. Oh, it's one of the rare things, one of the rare, it's one of the few times that I've listened to something that I've created or been part of creating and just gone, wow. When he sent it to me, I just went, oh my God, it just. It's just brilliant, like, do you know what I mean? I know it's my stuff, and we probably shouldn't be saying that, but he just did an amazing job on it, like. So, yeah, the poetry collection and the album will probably, it's probably going to be early next year, and I'm going to send up a, you know, GoFundMe page around that. But, you know, it's like everything else, you know, creating an album, publishing a book, writing, you know, getting the layout done, getting it edited. You know, I want to pay musicians. I'm a huge believer we should pay artists. When we ran yeah. the Souls to Sounds, we paid the editor. When, we, when I was involved in running the All-Island Slams, I insisted that the, the uh, participants and the judges were paid and found, found the money somewhere, you know? Because I just think that we live in a world where this, this idea that art is free is absolutely insane. Like, do you know what I mean? It winds, me, it winds me up completely. Yeah. You want to see the big thing that winds me up, we start mentioning that, because Amanda's had that problem before now, where people think they can connie to do it with nothing for them, and I'm thinking, no. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely that one. Right, anyway, Stan, okay, to conclude, obviously, mate, if people want to find out more about you, where are the best going? Well, the easiest place to go is to my website, so it's stannockcreations.ie. My surname is spelled N for November, O for Oscar, T for Tango, T for Tango, E for Echo. But if you get the if you get the surname correct and Stan, you'll find me straight away. It's a very unusual name. It's stannockcreations.ie. Loads of art up there, loads of videos up there, loads of 
products up there. I'm, you know, I, I'm going to sell myself like a horse and I get on my website and buy something. I ship worldwide. <laughs> Welcomely, as I would say, don't you, mate? So sounds, <laughs> yeah. good, sounds great to me, mate. Okay, okay, mate. Well, what we'll then do is we'll wrap up here then for you. We'll let you go and get yourself composed for two minutes for us and we'll be right back. It's been tremendous today. I've really enjoyed this time. You're, you're a pleasure talking to you, mate. So, right, everybody, hang around. We should be back in two minutes. See you all in a minute. Spoke on, mate. Hi, guys. Still here with Stan. I'm looking forward to this. Over to you, mate. Okay, so the first piece I'm going to do is a piece I just wrote today. It's called Gold Medals, and it's about the two Cork lads who won the uh, the, the lightweight skulls, dub, double gold medals coming back to Cork. It's in Cork lingo. I'll send Andy the translation because you'll probably need it. And it's in a very strong Cork accent, and I'm going to sing a bit. So, you know, I just tell you, I'm a really bad singer. Anyway, Gold Medals. Come here to me, fiends. Come here to me, Bjors. Did you see the skid boys winning the gold medal at the old Olympics? Sure, of course you did. Wasn't the whole country watching them rebel fiends show the world that skibbereen is the berries, that cock is the berries, and that rebel fiends are the berries of the berries of the berries all together, by? I'll tell you one thing for nothing, though. There's nothing lightweight about Paul and Finton, which is just as well, because there's going to be a lang a load of port waiting for them when they get home, by. And can you imagine the sing-song they'll be having in West Cock when the whole town is stoshes from Gatton from morning to night? Can you imagine it, boy? Can you imagine it? I can, because it's going to be as baloop as is the crack we had singing ole, 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 back in the day when Jackie's army was on the march, big time. The only difference now, boy, is this sing-song is going to be all about gold. Pure, massive gold medals hanging around the necks of two pure, sound, decent rebel fiends. I think that song will go a bit like this, by Gold, gold, two rebel fiends have won gold. They pulled and they pulled and they rode so indestructible. That's why they won the gold. They got gold, gold. Those massive fiends have won gold. And now they are bringing it home. We are in party mode. Let the porter flow. Yep, that's how it goes for sure, boy. So raise a glass for Finton. Pull a pint for Paul. It's party time, boy. And we're gone getting on. Gold, gold. Two rebel fiends have won gold. They pulled and they pulled and they rode. So indestructible. That's why they won the gold. They got gold, gold. Those massive fiends have won gold. And now they are bringing it home. We are in party mode. Let the porter flow. Wouldn't doubt you, Paul. Wouldn't doubt you, Finton. Rebels are boo. Rebels are boo. That's that one there. Uh, Tremendous. And you did that this morning, wrote that this morning, did you? Wow. <laughs> yeah, I wrote that this morning. Yeah, wow. Yeah. yeah, definitely send the translation to that one, mate. <laughs> I'll put it at the bottom of the podcast for people, yeah. definitely. <laughs> okay, mate, over to your, your proper start now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what I predominantly do is I write I write poetry using song titles of a chosen artist. So this one is a, is a poem I wrote using Amy Winehouse as uh, song titles. I wanted to share share it tonight because she's it's 10 years this week since she passed away an unbelievable loss to to the music industry such a such and such a such a talent but this is a real short one anyway um and it's called i heard love is blind me and mr jones in my bed my body and soul addicted but we're just friends and i wake up alone when mr jones goes back to valerie his black best friend, whose fuck me pumps are, str are a stronger cupid than mine. Between the cheats, I think love is a losing game. But right now, I know there is no greater love and that our day will come. So that's oh, my what? short little oh, tribute. Wow, I see what you mean there. Yeah, that's, that's lovely, that one. Yeah. Really, really quite touching. So nice to contrast to the first piece, definitely, as well. So. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, man. <laughs> we're going to have another huge contrast here. So this this piece is a for me is a really interesting piece. It's a very very direct comment on mental health. So a number of years ago, when I was dealing with a different, you know, I don't know about when when my mental health journey, you go up and down and out, you get these epiphany moments. And we have a huge suicide problem here in Ireland, and, and particularly in Cork and Limerick. Uh, and I was talking to somebody, and I was saying, you know, the only way we can actually change anything is if we get really honest about what's going on. 
and, and obviously talking about mental health and suicide is really difficult. So I ended up writing this piece. I wrote it using Depeche Mode song titles. I've no idea why that happened apart from obviously I wanted to write something about mental health and I was looking at Depeche Mode song titles at the time. This is called, and this is quite dark, uh, but it does get brighter towards the end. This is called Policy of Truth. The truth is tonight, a dark trance spent the night. The truth is this happens all the time to broken, damaged people. The truth is I am broken, damaged, fractured. The truth is it's no good being broken, damaged, fractured. The truth is broken, damaged people feel free love, estranged love. The truth is broken, damaged people are always fools to fragile tension. The truth is fractured, damaged people rush to pain. The truth is broken, damaged people surrender to addiction, fall into the abyss. The truth is for broken, damaged people, choosing the dark road is the price of love. The truth is choosing the dark road is a pain that I'm used to and suffer well. The truth is broken, damaged people always rebirth stories of old. The truth is in a world full of nothing, scared, sacred shame soothes my soul. The truth is addiction tears you apart. The truth is sometimes, in the dead of night, I wish I were dead. The truth is, I promise you, I will hold on. The truth is, the child inside is miles away, gone, lost. The truth is, all I ever wanted is to shake the disease. The truth is, I just can't get enough of endless excess and compulsion. The truth is, I'm useless, gone too far, a horror story. The truth is, pain stripped my joy. The truth is, pain shouldn't have done that. The truth is, one thing, one caress can light my sun. The truth is, the future starts here. The truth is, when turning away from condemnation, I feel love. The truth is, I promise you, I will just try. The truth is, the great outdoors soothes my soul. The truth is, better days remotivate me. The truth is, I'm in control. The truth is, nothing is impossible. The truth is, I like that insight. The truth is, I am human, and the truth is I am you. And that's that one. Wow, yeah, see what I mean? That is completely different again, yeah. Excellent stuff, really, 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 really heavy hitting, but also thoughtful. Good combination there, mate, so. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, it's very, it's, I mean, I've said before, I was never suicidal, but I, I, I think anybody who's been, deeply depressed and I was plays with the idea in some shape or form you know but when I write about mental health I always like to have the kind of um the hope at the end of it because I somehow even in the darkest days I always had you know I always kind of believed I'd come through it always. yeah yeah same for me okay. when I, same for me with the history of depression I've had over the years as well yeah. is I don't think you realize sometimes of it how heavy how far down you can be until oh yeah until you really it's are down. You know, yeah it's only in hindsight you know how deep it was yeah I'd agree yeah with that. Yeah, completely, mate. Okay, on to number four. Okay, so this one is much brighter, thank the Lord. Um, it's kind of a love poem. It was uh, written using um, Van Morrison song titles. And what I liked about this when I was, the, the title kind of um, dictated how it would go. So the title is called In Search of Grace. And it's there's, there's a play on the fact that grace can be a woman's name and grace can be a kind of spiritual thing as well, you know. So In Search of Grace. At the end of a golden autumn day, as the leaves and evening sun come falling down, a song in high spirits is carrying a torch and a sense of wonder that reminds me my crazy love for you was once the centerpiece of my life. And I have finally come to realize the meaning of loneliness is trying for sleep when evening shadows filled with melancholia and a lifetime of memories take me back to magic times, ancient highways, on a wild, stormy Monday night and the warm feeling of laughing in the wind, the way young lovers do, when out of sight in the back room, allowing Caledonian soul music to keep the mediocrity of ordinary life at bay. I can tell now how precious that perfect moment in time beside you was, and the 32 years wasted singing the blues, chasing fame, and a big royalty check were too much trouble. I'm confessing, someone like you is a benediction, an enlightenment on the mystery that is life. 
So on this dark night of the soul, I'm going to dress in black, stop drinking moonshine whiskey, plant purple heather bulbs in the garden and say a lover's prayer until some peace of mind fills my songwriting soul with the joyous sound of three chords and truth. Then I shall sing a new biography called I Can't Stop Loving You, make clear how you and the warm, satisfied feeling of the early days is what I'm living for, that more and more, my sweet thing, I wonder, could you, would you, come back, turn on your love light and start all over again? Oh, that's that. Excellent, excellent, that one, great. I got I got a couple of the Von Morrison's lyrics in that as well, so I said, but no, definitely, oh, that character, that really, really good piece, mate, excellent. Right, we're on to, as I always say now, the big finale. The big finale. If, if I could play yeah. trumpet, I'd be playing the trumpet if you now for you, mate. Yeah, yeah. You up. Drum roll, <laughs> drum roll, drum roll. Drum, 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 I'm, I'm going to leave you with a piece that um, is one of my favourite pieces that I wrote, that I've written, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it is really positive, and it was written around the time that I got to this place where I was much more content in myself, much more comfortable who I was, and... I'm generally in a good place more than I am in a bad place. That was one of the motivations. The second one is I found that the practice of gratitude has been hugely important um, in my recovery with from mental health. Not that I'm completely cured. I don't think you ever are. And the third thing was it was written using song titles of the Eels, an American band who have this um, reputation for being really dour and depressing, I suppose, is the best word, a bit like radio. But I actually think they're hugely uplifting. So I decided I'd try and write something positive with the song titles almost as an act of defiance. And, and this is what came out. It's called Ingratitude for This Magnificent Day. I'm a hummingbird this morning. I'm feeling so good I'm fitting in with the misfits. And my useless trinkets tattoo love the loveless on rusty pipes in our cathedral. In the yard behind the church, a Jehovah's Witness prays into God's silence for a good deal while a pretty strawberry blonde ballerina with eyes down dreams about being a true original and an altar boy with a fly swatter fingertips a daisy looking up through concrete at sky writing that says oh what a beautiful morning there's something strange about an altar boy with a fly swatter but i like the way this is going so when an oh so lovely lilac breeze flowers and animal Animals answer bone dry apples that shine like blinking lights, a sweet little thing, a kindred spirit maybe, tips longing that feels like the beginning of I can't help falling in love into this town, and an overture filled with all the beautiful things I have to offer. My sad raincoat, a $200 tattoo, the mistakes of my youth, soars like a swallow in the sun singing, hey man, now you're really living. And I know today is the day estranged friends man up and bow out of the quandary of the last time we spoke, you were so unpleasant. Man, where I'm at is an epiphany. And the only thing I care about is living the mystery of life. So at dusk, I am building a shrine to this wonderful, glorious and magic world. Because these are things the grandchildren should know in gratitude for this magnificent day. I'm a hummingbird filled with longing that feels like the beginning of I can't help falling in love with all of these beautiful things. Oh, wow. I mean, what a thoughtful piece was. It was really quite tender, that was, since then. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure today having you on, mate. So hang around with... I do need to quit the off my off my course, but I've really enjoyed it today, Stan. Come listen, back on again, come back on again, mate, when you box out. Love to have you on again, mate. Yeah. And listen, thanks so much for having me, Andy. I really appreciate it. I really do appreciate it. So it's uh, like what you're doing there, I think, is amazing. Like when you told me earlier on that the number you have, I had no idea of that, but I have dipped in and out of it. And especially when I see people I know like Alvi Carragher going on. But it's, yeah, it's yeah. brilliant what you're doing, it's given a platform to, you know, the, finding platforms, especially for spoken word artists is really difficult. So, yeah, really appreciate yeah. what you're doing, man. Keep in touch, mate, definitely. So, anyway, guys and girls, as Don Callis says over at Impact Wrestling, stay safe and stay over. We'll see you all next time. Take care.
spoken language.